Hey guys, thanks for joining me. So today we're actually going to go down the road of baking gluten-free bread. So in the past, we've found that gluten-free bread oftentimes lacks texture that uh, normal gluten-based breads do. And it's been quite a journey trying to figure out how to make gluten-free bread, uh, but we think that we got this one nailed. It looks like it's a great recipe, and the loaves that you get are really, really good. Now I will say that this is not just bread, this is actually a sourdough recipe, so we're actually using our own gluten-free the sourdough starter. This one has been started about two weeks ago and it's really really ready to use at this point. So uh, I'll talk a little bit now about what ingredients that we're using. So we purchase our flour from Jamestown Mills. I found that this flour works really really well for sourdough loaf. This particular flour has oats as one of the main ingredients and the oats tend to be really sticky. Now one thing about gluten-free bread compared to normal gluten-based breads is that the gluten tends to make the bread really stretchy and it allows it to kind of capture air and it rises in quite a different way than what gluten-free breads do. Gluten-free breads tend to come from something that's more like a batter. It's really sticky and uh, it's not really you know, malleable and pliable and kneadable like a gluten-based bread. But there's kind of a few ways to get around that to actually get a really good gluten-free loaf. So to start, we have three cups of the Jamestown all-purpose flour. Like I said, it's a gluten-free based flour, but it's loaded with oats. It's a nice sticky flour. We found that it works really, really well. So that's into the bowl, so that's three cups. All the dry ingredients go in first. Now, in order to be able to, to get a bread that kind of, you know, has some, some sponginess to it, that has some spring to it, we add extra xanthan. The actual all-purpose flour that we have here already has xanthan in it, but we add a teaspoon and a half. There is one teaspoon of salt. And there is a teaspoon of sugar. Now that's basically all of the dry ingredients that need to go into here. So to ensure that that xanthan is really kind of mixed through, because xanthan clumps once you add liquid to it, I just whisk it through. So it's really just whisked through uh, as a dry mixture to ensure that that xanthan is kind of all broken up and it's evenly distributed through the flour. It also tends to break up some of the some of the clumps in the flour also. So at this point now we're ready to start adding the wet ingredients. So the wet ingredients are okay so we have basically a cup and a half of water but in order to account for the fact that I'm putting in a large egg I actually end up taking out like two tablespoons of water. You could probably leave it in there, but I take it out and it seems to work fine. I've never tried it by leaving it in, but I'm sure it would still be fine also. The loaf would just have a little bit of extra moisture and it probably wouldn't actually cause any problems. This goes into the bowl. One large egg. And we have honey. So the honey uh, we find adds an extra little bit of flavor and it also helps feed some of that yeast, which is good. So one tablespoon there. And this is just raw honey right from one of our local beekeepers actually. And then our starter. So the starter, like I said, is a starter that was started two weeks ago and it's been fed multiple times. 
And this morning it actually started down here and I added basically the food to it, which is more flour. And you can see it's almost doubled in height and that's under eight hours. So um, this guy is ready to go. This was gonna go into here also now. Now I'm gonna measure this one out. I find that a third of a cup of the starter actually works really well. Now, when I actually pull the starter out and put it into the mixing cup, I don't actually kind of beat it down in order to get all the air out of it. It's just really, you, you take out what looks like a third of a cup, uh, measure it out into a, a cup measure, and you can see that it's really foamy, kind of really foamy and airy, and smells like yeast, and it has kind of some of that sour smell to it, which you'd expect from your sourdough bread, your sourdough starter. So that's into the bowl also. Last but not least, two tablespoons of oil. Um, I've tried this with olive oil, works well. I've tried it with veg oil, works well. Um, either case, either works, so I wouldn't worry about what type of oil. It seems that either of them are fine. All right, so now it's the hard part. There's no way to knead this like you would with a gluten-based bread. So you have to mix it. So I start by folding. And I just keep folding it around and that absorbs a lot of the moisture up front. And I keep twisting it over like so. And you can, if you were here by me now, you could hear it as it's really mushy sounding. It actually sounds really mucky. And that's actually normal because it's not a gluten based bread you know, it's going to sound really mucky and really wet because it, it really is. And the key is here is to just mash it together, get all those dry ingredients mixed through, and even the stuff way down on the bottom of the bowl. And for now, we're going to break. And when I come back, I'm going to show you the consistency of this dough. All right, so we're about five minutes into the mixing phase here now, and it's starting to look really, really nice. It's really sticky still, and it will actually stay sticky, but you can see that it's really homogeneous now. There are no lumps or bumps or anything like that in it. And if you push it against the side of the bowl, you see it spreads almost like butter. And as you're spreading it, you can I guess fold it back onto itself and I find that that's easier to do than trying to knead it by hand which is almost impossible for a gluten free based bread. So this is going to sit on the countertop overnight. It's going to undergo its bulk fermentation. Sometimes people put sourdough in the fridge. I don't bother. I find that it actually works fine as is. There's no gluten development here in terms of what the yeast and the bacteria are doing like it will with sourdough. So this is going to stay sticky. It's never going to be stretchy. You can let it undergo its bulk fermentation overnight on the countertop and move right to kneading, go through a secondary rise, and then it goes in the oven. So right now we're going to put the cover on it. We have a, just a wax wrap that we put over the top just to keep it from drying out overnight sits back on the countertop and tomorrow morning bright and early we'll do um, the kneading on this and we'll form it into a nice loaf and then it's straight into the oven after a secondary rise. Alright so good morning it's time to get the bread on the go again so i uh, pull the cover off and well immediately you can smell that uh, sourdough smell you can see that the bread is probably doubled in size if I were to guess overnight and uh, of course it's still pretty sticky now it will roll away from the bowl but uh, you know it's it's pretty sticky so at this point is where I'm going to do I guess the primary kneading kneading is going to be pretty hard because like I said it is it is sticky but the key is is to make sure that you're using uh, some of your flour now I use a screen kind of you know just screen it out over the countertop so it's not lumpy and stuff like so 
you know, good even coverage and roll the dough and onto the countertop also. Now you can see that area there is really sticky. So I'm going to get some more flour kind of on the top of it so that my hands don't stick to it. And a little bit of that on my hands. So, and you can see that you can, it's, it's nice and spongy, but you can see that it's, it's really sticky. So you kind of want to want to roll it out and every time you do it get it back into the flour again and you kind of really need to push on it to get it to stick it's not like gluten based dough at all but it can be kneaded as you can see so there's no stickiness on my hands at all now and I'm actually kneading that like I would kind of regular bread but there is a point when the surface of it starts to get really wet right here now I can feel it so give it a good rub over again and if you stretch it too far you see what happens you get this stickiness on your hands so the key is, is don't push it too far and now that's about as much as I need to do it and at this point I want to form I guess the bowl that I'm going to actually bake in the oven. So the trick here is you, you want to get a surface that's kind of nice and smooth, but you're not going to get it smooth like a gluten-based dough because what starts to happen is you start to tear away areas where you get these air bubbles. So it does take a little bit of finessing to kind of get this right and the key is is to kind of in those areas where it starts to break apart I kind of just slap it until it comes back together again and you can see it's starting to form pretty good and I'm just pushing that under to kind of pull out the top and look there's an air bubble there that needs to be padded so if I flip that over you see it's going to open like it's, it hasn't stuck together so you want to get your fingers in there and really push that dough together the dry flour that's on the countertop is uh, kind of not doing a very good job of keeping that dough together below so you kind of need to work it a little bit from from the bottom so you see now it looks like it's a mess but it, it won't be I promise and a little bit of flour. Slap the bottom down. All right, so at this point, I've flipped the dough back over, and you can see that it's fairly nice bowl at this point. And any places where it looks like there's an air bubble, you can kind of tap it down, and it will stick back together. And I find that kind of slapping it to help even out those areas does help and at this point now this is actually ready to go for a secondary rise so to do our secondary rise um, you could actually get a uh, bread rising basket I haven't bothered I just use a glass bowl and a clean dish towel and I push that dish towel down here like this and the key is that you don't want the dough to actually stick to the towel. And believe me, it won't. Uh, the key is, is just getting some flour and making sure that the surface of your bread is completely coated down uh, with flour. And that way it doesn't stick. It's perfect. Okay, now getting it into the bowl is a little bit of a juggling act because you don't want to kind of destroy the shape so it will rise back into the shape that it needs to based on the bowl so I wouldn't worry a whole lot about it but basically I get my my fingers under the corner flip it quickly drop it in the bowl now that's it so I can show you here now that you know it's sitting nicely in the bowl and yeah you can see my finger marks right here but uh, 
when this goes for a secondary rise now, that's all going to even out, so I wouldn't worry a whole lot about it. All right, at this point, I'm going to get this one covered up, and now it's ready to proof again. So this is really our, our second rise, um, and after this, it's going to be ready for the oven. So I usually let it go until it's about twice the size of what it was when I first put it in the bowl. Now, if you have a warm place in your house, put it there. If you don't have a warm place, you know, and you have a bread proofing option in your oven, you know, that's where what I use, that's where I put it. Um, otherwise, you can let it sit on your counter. It will take extra time for it to rise, but it will rise. So with that, I'm gonna set this aside. Every hour or so, I'm gonna check it to see if it's doubled in size, and uh, then it'll be ready for baking, and uh, I'll show you guys kind of how I get that ready and how it goes into the oven to ensure that you actually get you know, good rise and decent oven spring on, on this gluten-free loaf. All right, so in the next step, uh, we're gonna get this bread in the oven baking. So it's been proofing now for several hours, and we can see that it's pretty much filled this bowl, so it's doubled in size easily. So for this step, we're gonna need a baking pan. Now, I don't have a Dutch oven. Uh, a lot of people use Dutch ovens for this, and Dutch ovens do make sense because they keep the moisture uh, around the bread uh, during baking, so it, the bread doesn't crust over before it has really a chance to rise. So instead, um, I use a baking pan with a piece of parchment, and I just take a roaster. This is just a turkey roaster, and I lay it over the bread when it goes in the oven. And in addition to that, um, I have another baking pan in the oven that's actually preheated now to 450. And I pour this one cup of water into that tray. That boils off and creates basically steam, which increases the humidity in the oven and then keeps the bread slack. So it keeps it from actually forming that crust so it can rise and actually form a really nice loaf. So the trick now is to get this from here to here. So we know that our gluten-free bread is pretty sticky, it can be, and we know that if we really kind of grab it, it's not gonna hold the structure, it's gonna lose all of its air. So it's fairly simple. I take the tray with the parchment, lay it over the bowl. I do the old flip -a and pull this off. So here's our bowl. And now for the reveal and see if our cloth is stuck and look, it's not, it's perfect. Okay, good. So that's risen nicely and it actually just needs to be scored now. So it's ready for that point because the oven is at 450 and it's ready to go. Now, slicing dough that's actually gluten-free dough doesn't work that well if you don't wet your knife. So it's not like a gluten-based bread where if you slice it, it won't actually stick to a sharp knife. So I use a paring, paring knife. I make sure that there's a good coat of water on it. And I'm gonna do two slices. And basically, I'm gonna slice from kind of halfway down the loaf, across on a diagonal, and then I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna do the same thing, almost forming an X so that as the bread wants to expand, it kind of pushes those areas open and you get kind of a nice pattern in the bread once it's, uh, once it's actually baked. So that's the next step. I'm gonna do that now. So like I said, get the, nice, the, the knife nice and wet and you want to approach it at a fairly steep angle so that, that way um, as the bread bakes, that, that uh, ear kind of starts to curl upwards. So I'm gonna start here now and I'm gonna slice into it all the way across now you see it's starting to stick. So the first thing I do is dip it back into the water. And there's our first slice. And I'll just make sure that that slice is nice and wet there like that. Now next, I'm going to rotate it. I'm gonna make sure that all that, any little bit of dough that was on there is actually off. And I start with a nice wet knife again. Now this time the loaf is flipped around and I'm going to come around this side this time. Now there's no sp specific way that you need to do this. Um, 
I just do it this way because it kind of looks nice in the end and uh, it forms a nice loaf. So. so the next slice is into the bread and you can see it's starting to pull. So as soon as you see it start to pull, make sure that you stop and you wet the knife again. Get any like, little bit of dough that's off of it and proceed to re-score. So there we go. And I'm gonna get down there a little bit further. Make sure that that score is open all the way along. And it's looking pretty good, as far as I can tell. I said it doesn't split the same as if you had a gluten-based dough, but that's fine. And you see it sticks, so get that off. Okay, there. Now that is actually ready for the oven. So getting this in the oven is a bit of a balancing act because there's kind of multiple things to do as I don't have a Dutch oven. So I need to get this in. I need to get it covered with this. I need to get the water into the base pan and then basically, you know, bake it with the cover on for 20 minutes and then bake it with the cover off for about 25 minutes. So we're down now 20 minutes from the original time. So at this point, we open the oven quickly. You see there's quite a bit of steam coming out still. That's fine. Pop off the cover and there's the loaf. Now let's go back in for 20 minutes. And all right, so time is up. Oven's off. And Set that on the cooling rack. Looks good. All right, so that's it. There we go. Well done. So that's 45 minutes of baking time. Now it's just to let it cool before we slice it.